Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you all this morning. I invite us to uh, recognize the Spirit's presence in this place as we begin worship together. And sometimes that just means that we have to take a breath and recognize that we can, we're here to be in the presence of God and of one another and just really soak that in. So I pray that the beginning of this worship service is an opportunity to just prepare our hearts and minds uh, as we begin to worship together. So would you breathe in with me and breathe out? Let's do it one more time. Breathe in and breathe out. Oh Lord, help us to relax. Take from us the tension that makes peace impossible sometimes. Take from us the fears that do not allow us to venture sometimes. Take from us the worries that blind our sight. Take from us the distress that hides our joy. Help us to know that we are with you and that you are caring for all of us, loving all of us, and that we are one with one another and with you. Let us worship together. Amen. Are we prepared? Oh, I saw people look up <laughs> in deep meditation. I'm Reverend Christian Dement, pastor here at La Mesa First and in the neighborhood. It is great to be gathered together. I see a lot of faces that we haven't been seeing in a while. It is great to have a whole family here for a baptism in just a moment. Uh, but it is great to be gathered together. I'll just fill you in on what we've been doing so that you can all catch up. We are in the midst of the season of Lent, and we've been learning how to live inside out. And that means we started off in Lent walking the journey with Jesus for 40 days, uh, contemplating God's call on our lives and how we might resist temptation and to uh, return our lives towards God. The second week, we were called to move, to move out into the world, to, to follow God's leading, even sometimes when we don't know where God is leading us. It's important to move. And last week, we were reminded that we are thirsty people. Oftentimes we try to quench our thirst with the things of this world, but we were reminded that God gives us the, th the, the waters that truly give life and that we are called to look to God to fulfill our lives and to give us full lives as well. And so today we are going to be talking about being chosen people by God, not only chosen in the past, but continually being chosen. And so I pray that our scripture, our song, our prayers all lead us to understanding that we are, to be, we are chosen and we are called to follow Christ and to be God's representative. 
representatives in the world. And doing that, we need to know the people that we're worshiping with and being called with. So I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able, turn to one another. We welcome you all, and we welcome those who are worshiping from home or wherever they might be online. It's great to see them all. Sing the first song of, of our worship this morning. I believe the lyrics are in your bulletin. Let us sing and let us worship together. seated. I'm going to invite the children to come on forward and join me right up here on the chancel steps. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, friends. It is so good to have you here this morning. This morning is a special morning for a variety of different reasons. One, it's just Sunday morning, and that's always special to be gathered together as God's people, as brothers and sisters, siblings, following Christ together. It's also a wonderful Sunday because we're going to celebrate a baptism here in just a moment. But it also is special because it's a reminder that we need to care for one another. Not only the people who are here that we see on a regular basis, but those who are connected with us through this church and in our community. As a matter of fact, Miss Ruby, would you, would you stand up or where, where might you be, Miss Ruby Roberts? Okay. Do you see Ruby right over there? Can you all wave at Miss Ruby? Hi, Miss Ruby. Oh yeah, you all can wave at her too. That's, that's good. You know, Ruby has a uh, grandson who's in need of prayer. And we have a prayer quilt right behind us. And we have this wonderful ministry, these wonderful people who gather together in a sewing room downstairs and put together pieces 
of, of um, material to create wonderful prayer quilts. And a prayer quilt is just like any sort of blanket that you may have at home. It's something that keeps you warm. It makes you comfortable. It makes you feel like you're safe and comforted uh, uh, in your bed or maybe on the couch or wherever it may be. But these are special because they have these little pieces of thread. You guys, can you guys see these pieces of thread here? And, and what is special about these is it becomes a prayer quilt when we think of the person who's going to receive it and offer our prayers of healing and care and love onto it, and they receive it. And each time they touch a knot that is tied on a prayer quilt, they are mindful that somebody in this congregation and beyond has been praying for them. And that comforts them just as much as just a blanket. And it's a special, special thing. So we waved at Miss Ruby, and her grandson is in need of prayer. Now, let's see. How old are you guys? How old are you? Five. Five? Eight. Eight? Six? Six? Ten. Five? Two five-year-olds, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old? One day. One day away from being ten. Yes, it's your birthday tomorrow, Jack. We, we want to celebrate that with you. Uh, some of you guys know my song. You know my Kelly and I's song. We're going to sing it. Yeah, let's do it. D- no, don't do it. No. Oh, come on. One, two, three, four. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey. <laughs> happy birthday, son. Awesome. Can you all say happy birthday? <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday, Jack. All right. Ten years old tomorrow, Cade? Four in four months, ten. I'll sing you a special song in four months. Oh, you've been 10 for four months. Excellent. Well, I'll sing you a song some other time, too. Gavin, how old are you? Hmm, got shy all of a sudden. Five. Excellent. And we've got... We don't know. Two? Ivan? Ten? I don't think... In seven and a half years, you'll be 10. Okay, anyway, all that to say... Ruby has a grandson, and he's 11 years old, so kind of almost the same age as some of you. And, you know, he's had a tough time in his life. He he was born with some challenges that caused him to have to stay in the hospital for a long time, caused him to have a lot of surgeries, and yet he's 11 years old, and he wants to live just like any other kid. He wants to play games. He wants to have fun. He wants to be with his friends. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of him actually when his mom received a prayer quilt. This is Micah. And, you know, he's having a tough time right now because he has COVID and he had a certain infection that has caused him to be in the hospital for 10 days. Yes, I know. And it's no fun because it makes you feel sick. And because of of some of his conditions, it's really made an impact on him. Well, you know what? He also goes by another name. It's not just Micah, but they call him Trooper. Trooper because he has gotten through a lot of difficulty And he needs to get through this difficulty too. So we're going to help him by praying our prayers on this prayer quilt. So can you guys stand up if you can and gather together around this prayer quilt. And if you guys don't mind, you can tie a knot on it. You can come around the back. You're going to be an example for this whole congregation on what we do for a prayer quilt. You just reach on in there. Come on up. Ivan, do you want to come on up? Hey, Ivan. And as you guys tie... a a knot that is a symbol of our prayers for Trooper, I'm going to offer this word of prayer too. Dear God, we pray for Micah. We pray for him as he goes through this difficult time. We pray that he, that he is able to get healthy and, and feel healed and feel like he could be a kid again, just like all of these kids want to be a kid every day. Lord, I pray that, that you pour out your healing on him and let these prayers that are symbolized by these knots make a difference and strengthen him and give him perseverance and courage and that, that he's able to leave the hospital and go back home and be with his friends and go to school just as his school friends want him to. We pray all of these things over Micah, a true trooper in our lives. We ask these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, all of you. And I got to tell you, even though he was born with some challenges, he has been called to be a great example of perseverance and strength for all of us. And he's living into that as a trooper. And so I hope you guys can can, um, uh, be inspired by his story and we'll give you updates on how Trooper is doing. So come right on down here. One more thing. It's a busy children's moment. Y'all just go along with us here. You guys want to take a seat right here? I'm going to invite the Goths to come forward. 
Because here's another real trooper in our, in our midst, in John Adrian Goff, Ivan, Felicia, and John. And he is coming before us to be baptized this morning. And it is a wonderful gift. It's a reminder that we are all called, just like Trooper is, just like you are. John is called to be one of, the, of God's family, to be a son of God, a beloved son and child. Oh, thank you very much. Hi, John. Hi, Felicia. Hi, John. Hi, Ivan. It is so special they bring these wonderful pins to celebrate this moment of baptism, and we give thanks for the gift of this life before us. And we are just excited that you are being called into this family, this family of God and this family of the church. And so with all of those things, sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's Spirit initiates us into Christ's holy church and gives us new birth through water and the Spirit. We are called to the water. Water poured over and immersing us. Water flowing freely for all who will receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. So we come to these waters to baptize John Adrian Goff and in each other's presence to renew our commitments to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. You are so attentive right now. Hi, buddy. Polar, polar opposites. Polar opposites. We're fine. That's all right. This is space for children to, pr- to play. Baptism is a naming. When Jesus came from the waters of the Jordan, he heard God saying, you are my beloved for whom I am well pleased. And from that moment on, we who are baptized hear that same voice. God calling us saying, you are my beloved son or daughter. You are my beloved child. For you, I am well pleased. In baptism, we are identified as the beloved children of God. You are beloved child of God, John. And so with all of that, I'm going to invite uh, you to respond to these questions, Felicia and John, on behalf of John. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this real world, and repent of sin? If so, you say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, you say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church with which Christ has opened to all people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, you would say, I do. I do. And will you nurture John in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and lead a Christian life? If so, you say, I will. I will. Excellent. And to all of you, Do you, as an extension of Christ's body, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, you say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith, life, and include John now before you in your care, proclaiming the good news and living according to the example of Christ? You would say, we will. Will you surround John with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in God's service to others? If so, you would say, we will. And finally, will you all pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life? If so, you would say, we will. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, the life you birthed in us by baptism into Jesus Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. Your healing river flows. Your spirit blows where it will, and we cannot stop it. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect redirect the winds of the Spirit. Or we walk so far away from the life-giving stream that we do not hear its sound and we forget its power. We thirst, O God. Come, refresh us. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come upon these waters. Let these waters renew us in the resurrection power of Jesus and make us long for your coming reign. Let them be for us drops of your mercy and a reminder of your righteousness and justice. 
Most holy God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, spirit of fire, water, and holiness, eternal God, one in three and three in one, all glory is yours now and forever. Amen. All right, John, here we go. It looks like you're in good hands. Are you ready? Hi, John. What's up, buddy? These waters are a reminder of the gift of life. It's a reminder of the waters that quench our thirst, the waters that, that fill us and nurture us and nourish us, the waters that cleanse us and clean us, the waters that make all creation grow. It is these waters in which we are baptized. So what full name is given this child? John Adrian Goff. I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God's love be present in your life. May you know God's love surround you always. And may you walk in the way that leads to life as you follow Christ in your life and your parents' work to guide you in that way. May God bless you in this special baptism. Amen. Will you all celebrate the newest child in our family of God, John Adrian Goff. Look at that. That is awesome. You are dripping wet. I love it. And we want to celebrate this by a little sheep, because you are now part of the fold, (laughs) and a wonderful book to remember this moment that maybe you can read to him, Ivan, in the near future. Can we celebrate this whole family in the midst of us as a part of our family today? May God bless you today and every day, and may God bless all of you today and every day. You can go to Sunday school as uh, they continue on. God bless you. Before we hear our anthem this morning, I just want to remind you as our kids go out that uh, there are lots of camp and retreat opportunities coming up for our children in the summer, but also an opportunity on April 16th to have a day-long experience that is like camp, but in a day, uh, a week-long camp in a day, and it's a great introduction to those who have never been to camp before, so I want you to check your e-newsletter for that. Also, um, Uh, In April, we will have a representative from the camps come and answer any questions that you may have for your child or your grandchild and help you sign up for camp. And so it will be a great celebration of that ministry. Um, And so we invite you to make sure that you're there and bring your kids so that they can all sign up together. It's a great, great experience. So let us continue in our worship and let this music inspire us. Thank you. 
great way to prepare for this time of prayer. I, I do just want to share something that was going through my mind as we were uh, listening to that is uh, we, we practice what's called a sprinkling in baptism. Uh, some experience full immersion, and there are other ways to experience baptism. Uh, and yet sprinkling always felt a little too light for me. And I was reminded by, I don't know, a pastor mentor in the, in the past somewhere along the lines that, that if your sleeves aren't wet, you haven't baptized them yet. I love having wet sleeves. It is so great um, to bring a child into the life of this church and into the life of God in such a special way. And I do have to say, you know, we don't recreate the words of, that, uh, that uh, we use for baptism. And um, uh, so, you know, sometimes you just change the names out. So Hattie was um, in, in my baptism uh, uh, paperwork this morning, and it was a reminder of, of Hattie's baptism as well. It's so great to have them all up here as family. It's a, it's a blessing. We uh, turn now to this time of prayer, and always, as always, we lift up uh, uh, churches in our district that we are connected with through our connection of the United Methodist Church. We pray for one of our closest uh, member churches, San Carlos United Methodist Church, and Reverend James Dollins, uh, we pray for them this morning as they are gathered together and worshiping and doing good work. Also, we want to lift up St. Mark's United Methodist Church and a pastor who actually comes from, from partly comes from this church, Darren Arntzen and uh, Jerry Newell Davis. And so we pray for these um, as they do their leadership in their places of, of worship. We also give thanks for... Um, uh, uh, Jan being back from uh, being away and serving at San Diego Korean, in which we prayed for last week, um, and we're, I was just told they went through a transition of pastors, and so now I just want to lift up Pastor uh, Derek Wynn. Um, he has been out because of serious health issues, and he's a young man with, with uh, a, an infant child or a toddler child and has been really having difficulty. He is healthy enough to now be leading that congregation, letting Jan come back here. But we want to pray for Derek Quinn and the, uh, the church family at San Diego Korean United Methodist Church in this time. I lift up prayers of thanksgiving. Um, uh, you know, being in a hundred-year-old church, uh, we have challenges sometimes. And one of the challenges is some leaky ceilings that happen over in our preschool. And I just give thanks for Derek Wilton and, uh, and Bill Kelly who came uh, with their their capes on, and then use their capes to wipe up all the water that had leaked through the ceiling and are working to fix our, our, our roof. Thank you, uh, Bill. I, Bill's not here, but let him know that we lifted him up. And uh, Derek, for, for um, coming in when we needed you. It's such a gift to know that you can call some, on people and they will be there for you. And so we pray Thanksgiving for that. We lift up uh, a couple in our congregation uh, that are dealing with um, rather difficult health situations. We want to pray for Carol Conger Cross continually as she continues to recover. Um, she has a variety of, of things going on, and they came from a recent fall that she had that she has been cared for in different hospital situations, and we just want to pray for her and for her healing and for Dale, her husband, as he seeks to find ways to care for her um, uh, and seeks resources to help care for both of them. We also want to lift up Anne Buffington continually. Uh, she's been moved uh, to uh, a uh, hospice care in Benita, and so we want to pray for her as uh, she walks this new journey and this new path in her life and, and knows that, that we walk this journey with her, and so we pray. We lift up Dale Barksdale. This is the brother of Donna and Bill Shaw for health and safe travels. And just as we prayed for Trooper this morning, uh, we do celebrate that he has come out of uh, uh, the induced coma that he has been in because of this COVID issue. Uh, he lifted up, though, to his dad. <laughs> this is hard. Because he's 11, right? He's just a bit down. He, f <clears throat> he feels that he's been through so much and he doesn't understand why. So we pray for Trooper, and so that prayer quilt will be available in the narthex, and we invite you all to surround that prayer quilt and offer your prayers. You can tie a knot on top of, of threads that have already been tied. Tie a knot on top of a knot on the top of a knot is a prayer on top of a prayer on top of a prayer, and so he needs those, and so we want to pray for them, and pray for you, Ruby, and the whole family. 
there's so much in the world to pray for as well. And we pray for God's justice and peace in all places, including our own community and in this church. Let us take these prayers for these individuals and for our community and the world to God. Let us take time in silence together to pray. God of miracles and mighty deeds, we acknowledge your healing and comforting presence in our lives. We confess that we've been drawn into the things of this world that has, have distracted us from recognizing your ongoing presence and the way that you work in our lives. Open our eyes to new ways of being. Send your blessings and grant us fresh insight for spiritual breakthroughs. Shine the light of your truth into our lives, our work, our families, and our relationships. Grant us the vision you seek for us. And in all of these things, may we be grateful in advance for your healing and the renewal in our lives and in the world. Gracious God, we pray for our neighbors, those down the street as well as those across oceans who need food, water, clothing, and shelter. We pray for all of our neighbors in this world who are in distress, whose bodies and minds need your peace and loving presence. We pray for all of our siblings whose lives have been upended by disaster and are in desperate need of provision and care. We pray for this family that makes up this globe, all of those of our faith and those of others, as we learn from one another that we are called to be witnesses and workers for the flourishing of all creation. Gracious God, we pray that goodness and mercy would follow us all our days, that we might be sharers of goodness and mercy everywhere we go. Call us to be your witnesses, to share what we've seen of you in the works and deeds of others, and may our lives be a witness as we claim our living faith as our vocation. May we support one another as co-workers of the building of your kingdom. And may we strengthen one another as one, as you have taught us to pray as one, praying together now that, son, that prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the, in the basket that I want to make sure that we lift up, we want to pray from Linda Mucka, Patty Kendrick, for successful gallbladder surgery. And so we pray for Patty's health and healing. We pray also from Linda, Carla, um, Osterly, uh, prayers for healing for um, a severely injured hand. And so we want to pray for Carla and for healing and comfort as well. And from uh, Ralph and Linda, they lift up Brother Wayne, who uh, has cancer. We've been praying for him in the past. They removed his kidney. Um, we want to pray for also Susan, a sister-in-law, who also has cancer. And so we pray for Susan and Wayne in this time and lift these to God. I also want to pray, pray a prayer just as, as Daryl's ready to invite our offering. Um, uh, one, that we, in our midst we have a, a new teacher who has come on to the staff of our children's center. A new teacher means that we can take on 10 more students in our preschool. And so we celebrate the fact that we have 30 on a waiting list. And so we can take a third of them into our, our children's center and give thanks for this new teacher and the ability to hire a new teacher. And that's something to celebrate. And also, yeah, that's worthy of a clap. And um, just this, sometimes these random things happen, but uh, a woman, Nancy, who I just know 
partially from a friend of a friend. She has been seeing what we're doing through our Facebook and through worship online that um, she just wanted to gift us with $1,000 with a, a to do whatever we want with it to uh, continue to do the work of this church. And I lift that up only because, you know, what we're doing is inspiring people in ways that they want to support that. And so I give thanks for Nancy and for the spirit of generosity um, and the gift that she has given that we can use in a way that continues to fulfill our call um, as a church to care for this community. So I celebrate that. A good segue. Through this invitation to share our gifts, we acknowledge that God has blessed us abundantly and that we are to be a blessing to the world. In our act of giving, in every act that blesses another, we find that we are blessed again. I encourage you now to enter fully into the cycle of blessing. We invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offering. You may also give online on our website and use the QR code in your bulletin. We've heard a lot about challenges today, and if you know anything about Chris, Chris, Chris Christopherson, who wrote this song that I'm going to sing, um, he and I both have self-inflicted challenges, shall we, shall we say. So I hope you enjoy it. Will you join me in prayer? Generous God, you care for each person you have created. You miraculously restore people to health and shine light into the lives of those who are discouraged. Guide us so that we will not regard others according to outward appearances, but seek to find your love in their hearts. We dedicate our offerings and ourselves to contribute to the work of your kingdom 
on earth until Christ again returns in glory. Amen. Quick here. Too often we think of being chosen by God as something for other people, for special ones like those who are called to wear a robe and a stole, or, or those who are mission workers out in the world who are willing to leave all things and go and live in a foreign place and, and to serve people in a different country with a different language, or something even beyond that. In our gospel today, we're going to hear that sometimes God calls specific people to specific tasks to be a living witness right where they are. We will hear a story of a man who is healed. We'll hear of an example of what a witness does. This witness today says, all I know, all I know. A witness is someone who tells what they know what happens in their lives, and how they understand how God is working in their lives. And that can be done by any of us. So as we listen, let God reveal to us our own call, our own vocation, and opportunities to share what we have already come to understand as God's work in our lives. Then let us be sent to declare the goodness and the ongoing presence of God in our living and our working. Here now, this scripture from the Gospel of John, it's a little long, like last week. Sometimes it helps if you want to reach for a Bible in front of you and read along too. It's John chapter 9, verses 1 to 41. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. Neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it looks like it's, it looks, but it is someone like him. Excuse me. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. 
So for the second time they called to the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? They reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an, under, an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. You know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading and hearing of his word. I realized that maybe I should have sat down. It's a long reading. But I did think about, like, well, maybe there's some parts that I can take out to just kind of, you know, summarize the story and let you hear the story without all the details, and, and you would get it all. But, but as I started to do that and, and go through that exercise, I realized, no, all of this is really important. All of this back and forth and this retelling of the story and people uh, uh, denying that a truth that is right before them and, and, and trying to convince people of, of a new, new experience and, and a new truth that, that the man was living into and, and the back and forth and the challenge all speaks to, to what this scripture is all about. You can't really remove any part of the story or else we miss part of the story. This miracle shows that Jesus is the giver of sight and revealer of truth. In this story, Jesus physically restores sight to a man, and he claims to be the light of the world. And he reveals the truth of his own identity as the son of man while challenging the Pharisees' blindness to that central truth. And on the surface, it seems like, well, just another one of those healing stories in the gospel, right? A blind man now sees. We've heard that before, and we'll hear it again. And it is a miraculous story. And it reveals Jesus' power and his bringing healing into to all who suffer and who are, who are on the margins. For, for this case, those who are lining the streets of first century Israel. But it is much more than that. For us, reading it from this place, it's an invest, inv invitation to look to the world through God's eyes. John gives us a glimpse of a new way to see this story of healing. Now, this healing starts with, with a question, one that I really think is quite misplaced. The question begins, well, why is this man blind? And the answer quickly is, well, it must be because he's done something wrong, right? And Jesus quickly says, you guys continue to ask the wrong question. Let's see what happens now. Let's change the script. Let's turn things around. 
The response to the question is to heal the man. The question being about sin and Jesus identifying himself as the one who overcomes sin, who, who moves past that and moves into a healing and a transformation. He wants to move the discussion beyond that of fault and focus on possibility. Boy, isn't that wonderful. We could all use that a little bit more in our lives. He says that this man in this moment is given to show the presence and power of God. He bends down, he gets some dirt, he spits in it, that's always uncomfortable, then rubs it on the man's eyes, even more uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, as I was filming the LM1 in one with, with Javier, we went to the little garden over in the children's center, and, and I thought about, maybe, maybe I should just spit in this dirt. I quickly realized that probably won't go so well. Although it might have increased the, the views on Facebook and might have created more comments, I knew that that was kind of gross and I'd stay away from it. Dirt. When I stuck my hands in the dirt, it was, well, dirt. Dirty. And then when I thought of spit, I thought, that's even more dirty. Now imagine mixing those two things together and creating something glorious, healing, restored sight. Taking the mundane, interestingly enough, the, the original Latin of mundane means of the earth. Taking the mundane to bring the glory of God. To take something super ordinary and even seen as kind of icky, and making something extraordinary out of it. There was a belief that, that God wants fancy stuff, God uses fancy things, that God wants extraordinary elements to do spectacular things. And yet Jesus changes the script once again and reminds us that God uses the mundane to do amazing things. The Old Testament selection for today comes from Samuel, and, and it's about God choosing David. David is the youngest and the smallest of a long line of brothers. And in, in that scripture from Samuel, it says, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, God says. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart looks beyond the ickiness, the things that make us uncomfortable, the challenges, and finds the true heart of everything. The mundane, dirt, spit, mud, us. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach. I came into the world so that those who do not see may see. I want to show you a new vision. But interesting in this story, for some reason, those who were questioning just didn't want to see things differently. They've been taught a certain way for a certain amount of time, and that anything that is presented to them could not change their mind. They were stuck in that lane and not willing to look beyond, even look at the things that are right in front of them. Have you ever known anybody who was like that? Have you been like that? The rest of this text after the healing is an argument about whether Jesus really healed or if it was some sort of trick. While they have the man who they had seen as blind all of these years and now can see and they still are questioning. And all the man could say is, hey, look, this is what I know. I can see. That should be good enough. Now, there's an interesting note here, just to take a little aside. Last week, we heard the longest conversation that Jesus had with anybody in the Gospels, the woman at the well, the, the most narrative conversation. Here in the Gospel of John is the longest period that Jesus leaves the scene. Did you catch that? Jesus heals, and then all of a sudden, there's this long part in the Gospel where Jesus isn't present. There's just this conversation that's going back and forth. It's... it's the longest um, outside of the, the birth narrative where, well, Jesus wasn't born yet, so there was a lot going on there. And then Jesus comes on, and, and then 
Jesus is, is there throughout the Gospel of John until this moment. And I found this interesting. One of the ideas or understandings of this was, was this narrative that happens is really the thing that should be happening in our lives as followers of Christ when Jesus is no longer here. That we should still be making a case. That we should still be looking for miracles. That we should still stand in the truth that we know. That God transforms lives. That God's love, love brings healing and restoration and reconciliation. That we should be arguing for this. Yes, even you and even me. Even when we think we're a bit mundane. Jesus is absent from this scene, and there's an understanding that the narrative of the healed man parallels Jesus in many ways. The crowd questions his identity. He asserts, I am this person. I am the guy that you used to see, and and I now can see. He speaks logically and frankly throughout, but is treated as, as an invalid witness to something that has happened. He is accused of being a sinner. And He fights with the Pharisees with his truth. The story within this story suggests that those who think they can see are blind to the truth, while the one who was blind is the one who sees. And it it provides us a vision of, of how we are called to follow Jesus even after he's left the stage of this earth. We should imitate Jesus as witnesses to the truth, despite opposition. We have this fight between between the religious leaders and and this man who has a new truth. And he is called. Interestingly enough, when after he he has the mud on his eyes, he goes and he is he's sent into the pool. That means send. It really speaks of, of being sent, of being called to now witness to others what you have experienced. It was called send because it was the end of a stream of, uh, of water that was provided for, for the people in that place. So the water was sent, right? But now it means something new. God does that. Jesus does that. Our gospel writers are very creative in doing that as well. Over and over, through this story, through the story of David being called, through the story of Jesus, over and over, God has given the same message. God has told us that the things we normally use to evaluate people are misdirected. Over and over, God has shown us that when we live on the surface, we sometimes miss what really is going on. Over and over, God tells us that that what oftentimes is rejected by others is used for God's vision. A vision of a world that should look different. A vision of a world that that God intended in the first place. I go back to that stained glass window sermon um, with that stone on the left. Uh, There's Jesus teaching, but on the left-hand side, there's a stone. It says Jesus Christ. And it reminds us that, that that stone that is rejected will be the head cornerstone. Those things that are seen as mundane or, or lack, lack the gifts that, that we all think that people should have is used. And like this blind man who's been sitting on the side and, and asking for help and, and, and somewhat being ignored on a regular basis, but is seen now becomes the one that reveals who Jesus is, the Son of Man, the light of the world, one who restores sight to the blind, one who casts a vision that moves us in the direction that we are called. And so there's another Latin word that comes up, and it's vocation. And vocation means to call. Now, most of us think of our vocation as the thing that that we go to each and every day that makes money, that pays the bills and keeps the lights on, or we hope it does. But God calls us beyond that vocation, possibly. Maybe your vocation is something that God has called you to. That God is calling us to a vocation that reflects the truth about God in ways that are oftentimes rejected. Showing love when it's expected that, that, that a negative response or a curt response or hate is, is often expected. Showing compassion and care when, when it's oftentimes expected that we just drive on by and we ignore. 
signs of, of reconciliation when most people would just turn their back on somebody and walk away because they've been offended. We are called to this vocation of living a way that looks different than the world expects. And the world actually has been taught to expect, right? The way that, that everybody thinks it should be just because that's the way it's been. A world that has war or injustice or people starving or, or not enough food uh, uh, to share with others. Jesus constantly showed that, no, 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 that's not what the world is all about. The world is filled with abundance. There is enough for everyone. Enough food, enough shelter, enough clothing, enough love. How can we be that example in the world today? How can we claim this as our vocation? How can we claim this as our call? Even if we feel rather ordinary, how is God really calling us to be extraordinary? Because God does use the mundane to do glorious work and bring the glory of God into the world. Well, I wouldn't just leave you with that question. I have some ways that you could respond. You know, uh, in the summer, we do this thing called Vacation Bible School, where 50 kids or more come and spend a whole week, just nine to noon, three hours a day, to celebrate being community together. But they sure do need adults who can guide them and help them. Maybe VBS is a thing that you're called to. I always lift up that, that every Sunday we have these wonderful children and a lot of us just stay here. Do you know what? Somebody's caring for them right now and providing uh, lesson and crafts and, and community so that they can grow in relationship with one another. Maybe you're called to do that. Or maybe you'll see uh, earth care activities offered. Uh, we have a lot coming up in, in April because, well, that's Earth Day is in April and, and we have a variety of different ways to educate, to advocate, and to act. Fresh Start is this Saturday. The Caring Ministry is here to pray for people on the patio this morning. Maybe you're called to that. Or maybe you're just called to go and engage with that. I went to a record um, sale this weekend. Now, that doesn't sound like a call. But, you know, our uh, campus steward, Mark Weedman, he's here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he helps keep our campus clean and, and organized. Well, he put on this record sale because his church, Summit Unitarian Universalist Church, Universalist Unitarian Church in, in Santee, is hosting the Interfaith Shelter. And so he was selling records to support the Interfaith Shelter there from April 1st to the 15th. I went to support it and bought some records. But what they really need is volunteers. And so there's an opportunity there. And, you know, we have this big celebration coming up on Easter. After, after we have a great celebration in worship with song and, 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 um, and just worshiping together and fellowship together, we're going to go out on the, on the uh, fellowship hall, or fellowship, excuse me, the fireside building, the fireside park, and enjoy an Easter egg hunt, uh, an Easter hat and bonnet contest for y'all. So be thinking of how you're going to decorate your hats and bonnets. We're going to have the Grossmont High School Jazz Quartet again come out. Six of them are going to play outside. We've got a Joy Full of Coffee trailer coming to, for those who uh, coffee is your thing. Crafts and a photo booth, but we could also use preparation and setting up for that on April 1st and April 8th. Maybe you're feeling called to do some of these things. Maybe you feel like, well, I don't have a special gift. We can find a place for you. But... I really encourage all these things to go beyond these walls in our own lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, and in our community. A place where, where we can show people a different vision of the world. Where we can show people a different way to treat one another. A different way that, that God intends for the world to be. I like, like to believe that God is giving us a new window to look through, a new vision. And when we look through that window, we can see the kingdom of God. And when we see the kingdom of God, we start moving towards it. And if, I, if we get enough people to start seeing that same vision and we continue to move forward and, and move towards it, then it becomes closer and closer and closer. And then what, what we believe is only reserved for heaven actually comes to earth, just as we pray every Sunday. 
this blind man who now can see. He had a truth, a new way of seeing the world. Unfortunately, many of the people around him were blind. Our goal is to continue to be called, to cast the vision, to live into the vision, to share the vision, and to let all these things move away from our eyes and see the glory of God before us and then be a part of that glory by sharing God's extraordinary love with one another. Let this be inspiration to us. Amen? Amen. Our acolyte coming forward was my sign that I was to wrap things up. <laughs> I pray that you'll come back again next Sunday as uh, we continue to learn to both listen to to the Spirit within and then to live that out into the world and participate throughout the week in the variety of ways that we are called. In this moment, let us be called out by this hymn of our faith. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able. Let us sing together as we close, God of love and God of power. It's uh, in your hymnal 578, and we're doing verses 1 through 3. Let us go forth. There is so much inspiration around us. Let's not keep it inside this building, but let's take it beyond this building. Let us be inspiration to one another. Let us go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.